Welcome everybody. How sticky are your proteins? That's the question we would like to answer with you today. My name is Juwami. I'm a PhD student at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam, and I will be doing this presentation together with Dea, another PhD student in our group. Before we start, I would like to thank some people, um, Jan van Eck and Robin Baumeister, two master students who did their uh, master thesis with us, uh, Erik van Dijk, a former PhD student in our group, and Dr. Sanna Abon, uh, both Dea and my PhD thesis supervisor. And of course, we would like to thank our funding sources, the NWO and the Mediata project. So if you look at a protein 3D structure, you typically see that the hydrophilic residues are on the outside where they can interact with the solvent and the hydrophobic residues are on the inside buried in the core. And we call this the hydrophobic effect. Now there are some hydrophobic residues that do appear on the outside of the protein and these typically have a function. So for example, um, they interact with other proteins, they bind to a ligand, um, sometimes they can also cause disease. So for example, they are linked to aggregation diseases such as Alzheimer or Parkinson. And so it is very important to know um, how hydrophobic the protein surface area is. And that's something we wanted to look at in this project. Now, there are three different ways in which we can measure uh, how hydrophobic a protein surface is. The first one is the total hydrophobic surface area which is the squared angstrom of all hydrophobic residues that appear on the protein surface. The second one is the relative hydrophobic surface area. So which fraction of a protein surface is hydrophobic? And the third one is the largest hydrophobic patch, which is the largest continuous region on the surface that is hydrophobic. And now this region typically, um, for example, plays a role in the protein-protein interactions or the protein ligand binding that I mentioned before. Now we use these three measures to uh, answer our research question, which is how sticky um, or how hydrophobic are the proteins uh, in the human proteome. Um, and we wanted to get some insight into the function as well. So we have some sub questions like um, how highly expressed or lowly expressed uh, are proteins with a large hydrophobic surface area? And um, what kind of function do they have? So are there, for example, more enriched in certain tissue types or certain diseases or certain molecular functions. Now to do this, we have a three-step approach. And the first one um, are the structure-based definitions. So we look at protein structures from the PDB um, and we analyze their total hydrophobic surface area, relative hydrophobic surface area, and the largest hydrophobic patch. Now the total hydrophobic surface area and the relative hydrophobic surface area we can calculate from uh, the DSSP. So we take the um, surface area calculations per residue, um, and we sum over them to get the total hydrophobic uh, surface area, and then we divide the total hydrophobic surface area by the total surface area to get the relative hydrophobic surface area. For the largest hydrophobic patch, we developed a new method that we call mole patch, um, which uses a network-based method to identify the largest continuous region of hydrophobic residues on the protein surface. The second step of our approach are sequence-based predictions. As most of you probably know, um, there are many, many more protein sequences available than protein structures. And so it's very valuable to know um, if we can actually predict these measures. So we mostly used um, already known predictors, uh, such as NetSurf-P, um, to do these predictions. And we looked at some of the features uh, that are most important um, when we want to predict these three measures. And finally, we give some initial insight into the function um, of these hydrophobic proteins. Um, so we looked at uh, tissue enrichment, uh, disease enrichment, function enrichment, um, and at the overall expression level um, of proteins with different amounts of uh, hydrophobic surface area in the human proteome. Now, of course, to do this, we need some data. Um, so for structure-based definitions, we took all proteins from the PDB and we filtered them on sequence identity. Um, and we also filtered out the transmembrane proteins and multimeric proteins, since these tend to have a larger hydrophobic surface area um, than other proteins. For the sequence-based predictions, um, we took all human uh, protein sequences from the uniprot, um, and we filtered these on disordered and size, so we took out the very, very large proteins. We also annotated which proteins were um, transmembrane regions um, and which proteins uh, were part of a multimeric protein. 
um, to see where in our um, scale of predictions these actually ended up. And so we would hope that these would get a larger hydrophobic surface area than other proteins. Now, the first most important thing to show you, we've been talking about these three measures, um, is that these three different definitions actually measure different things. So in this example, you see two different proteins where the hydrophilic residues are indicated in blue. The largest hydrophobic patch is indicated in red. And the other hydrophobic residues are indicated in yellow. And so in this case, the red ones, the largest hydrophobic patch is identified by our method mole patch. And um, we also give the values for our three measures. And what you can see is that for the protein on the right, the total hydrophobic surface area is about one and a half times bigger for the protein on the right than for the protein on the left. Whereas the relative hydrophobic surface area is only about 30% bigger. Um, and the largest hydrophobic patch is actually almost three times bigger for the protein on the right and for the protein on the left. And so there is such a big difference um, between these three different measures that we can actually say that they measure different things. And from here, Dea will take over um, and talk about uh, the sequence-based predictions. As Yuami mentioned, after structure-based definitions, we moved on to the second part of the study. Since there are many more protein sequences than structures available, it's highly valuable to be able to predict these hydrophobic measures straight from the sequence, which will allow us to characterize a much broader set of proteins. To predict the total and relative hydrophobic surface area, we've used the tool called NetSurfB, which provides surface accessibility predictions per residue. To obtain the total hydrophobic surface area, we summed over the predicted accessible surface area for all hydrophobic residues. And in order to calculate the relative hydrophobic surface area, we summed over the predicted accessible surface area of all the residues, and then divided the total hydrophobic surface area by this value. To predict the large hydrophobic patches from the sequence, the large hydrophobic patch determined by mole patch was used as gold standard. The training procedure for the TFM and GFM models predicting the LHB was performed in a similar fashion to the training of THSA and RHSA. But because the NetSurfB predictions cannot be used to predict the large hydrophobic patch directly, an additional model was trained that used the total and relative hydrophobic surface area predicted by NetSurfB as input features to predict the large hydrophobic patches and it's called NBM, so the NetSurfB based model. And you can see that the NBM outperforms the other two methods. Firstly, before I move to uh, the further results, I would like to refresh your mind about the data sets that were used in the study. So in blue, we have structure-based definitions from the PDB. We show the sequence-based predictions in the human proteome in red, and within the human proteome, we selected subsections of transmembrane in yellow and multimeric proteins in gray. For approximately 15,000 proteins in the human proteome, we were able to predict all our three measures, total hydrophobic surface area, relative hydrophobic surface area, and largest patches. This figure shows a comparison of the distribution of these definitions within these sets. Proteins in structure-based datasets appear to be smaller compared to those in the curated human proteome, if you look at the protein length. In line with this, we see that the THSA and LHB distributions are strongly shifted towards the right-hand side. Compared to the structure-based data, most likely due to the larger size of the proteins in the human proteome. Moreover, the structure-based data sets in blue does not show a peak of very large hydrophobic patches at around 6,500 angstrom as observed for the human proteome data set. Importantly, structure-based data analyzed by mole patch neither contains transmembrane nor multimeric proteins. Both groups of proteins might be expected to have very large hydrophobic surfaces. To investigate if this peak for the human proteome might be due to transmembrane and multimeric proteins, we selected those proteins annotated by Uniprot as transmembrane in yellow or the multimeric proteins in gray. And indeed, after selecting transmembrane proteins from the human proteome data set, the composition of the peak of the large hydrophobic patches, as well as the shoulder in the RHSA distribution, can be explained predominantly 
through the transmembrane annotated proteins. This results also suggest the machine learning model NBM successfully predicted transmembrane proteins to have very large hydrophobic patches despite the lack of transmembrane proteins in the training data. Since hydrophobic characteristics are associated with aggregation tendencies, we wanted to investigate whether proteins with large hydrophobic surface areas have different expression levels. And for this, we use RNA consensus data from human proteome atlas HBA. For this, we relate normalized expression data to measures for surface hydrophobicity. And to obtain a single expression value for each gene, we selected the highest normalized expression value within the tissues that a certain gene is expressed in. This figure shows that the higher the expression level of the protein, the lower the THSA, RHSA, and LHP values. Based on these results, we might assume that the human proteome avoids the highly expressed overabundant sticky proteins. We also explored the highly expressed genes based on the median normalized expression value across all the tissue that a certain gene is expressed in. And these values show a similar trend. Interestingly, the proteins that do not follow the general trend, for example, those that are highly expressed while having the large THSA, RHSA, and LHB values are typically protein subunits assembling large multimeric complexes. In such complexes, the proteins are likely to be stably bound and are hence able to shield the hydrophobic surfaces from the solvent. After analyzing normalized expression value, we moved on to investigate the specific tissue enriched genes, and we extracted five tissue enriched genes from human proteome atlas. Enriched here means that the expression of this gene in a certain tissue is at least four times higher in any other tissue. We used pre-ranked GSCA analysis to explore the link between the tissue specific proteome and the hydrophobic measures. This table shows that the brain and kidney tissue enriched gene sets have high enrichment in predicted THSA and LHB values. Kidney enriched genes show the highest enrichment in all of those three hydrophobic measures. A possible explanation for this is the major role of kidney in maintaining homeostasis through various transmembrane, membrane-bound receptors and transporters. And indeed, almost 80% of the kidney-specific proteome is annotated as transmembrane by Uniprot. And this might explain the overall stickiness of the kidney-specific proteome. Intrigued by these findings and by the tissue-specific proteome hydrophobicity, we moved on to the pre-ranked GSCA analysis of disease-associated gene sets. And we analyzed over 300 gene sets that are associated to certain types of diseases. And we selected the ones that were significantly enriched in at least two of our hydrophobic measures. Among the selected gene sets, several CAG pathways associated with neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease and Alzheimer's drew our attention. Interestingly, the relative hydrophobic surface area showed a significant enrichment in all of those three uh, CAG pathways. This analysis also showed a significant enrichment of sticky proteins based on the large hydrophobic patches in CAG Parkinson's disease map. In contrast to the GSCA analysis results on tissue-specific proteome, the total hydrophobic surface area shows a negative enrichment in these sets suggesting that the proteins involved in these pathological pathways have large hydrophobic surfaces, but they are smaller in size. To summarize, in this work, we analyzed the predictability and biological role of hydrophobic areas on the protein surface, which until recently was a difficult problem. We show that the THSA and RHSA values can be very well predicted. On the other hand, large hydrophobic patch values cannot be directly predicted uh, by NetSurf-B and need an additional model training. And the prediction is quite challenging still. When investigating the link between the tissue-based expression levels and measures of surface hydrophobicity, we see a clear link that human proteome avoids the overabundant, highly sticky proteins. In addition, we show that brain tissue expresses relatively many proteins with large hydrophobic surface area. And this overall stickiness of the brain-specific proteome gives a possible explanation for why the brain is relatively prone to diseases that are associated with protein 
misfolding and aggregation. This study has important implications, especially for the Mediated Consortium in which I'm involved in. The main purpose of this consortium is the development of biomarkers for specific dementia types. Since various neurodegenerative diseases are associated with protein misfolding and aggregation, and we've seen in previous studies that the protein uh, surface hydrophobicity plays a crucial role in this, the deeper understanding of these hydrophobic measures and the ability to predict it based on a sequence is essential. Moreover, we believe that the recent advancements in deep neural nets, contact map predictions, and structure predictions should make it possible for the large hydrophobic patch predictions to be more accurate in the near future. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and our group at Rye University of Amsterdam for our discussions and their ideas. And also uh, thanks to Mediade Consortium and NWO for funding this study. Thank you very much, and we are ready for your questions.